Howdy folks, welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to work on this Clark GCX 30 forklift. This is the machine that was sitting in a field for 17 years and in a previous video we got it running and in a follow-up video we brought it back to my shop. So for the last four-ish months the machine's been sitting in the shop here just slowly coming up to temperature. I have used it a tiny bit but I finally sold my old faithful Clark C300 forklift and now we got to fix this guy up so we can use it full time. And as you might expect, after sitting in a field for 17 years, there is a laundry list of problems. Okay, problem the first, this forklift did not have forks, and I have solved that problem. These are a set of class three forks that I had left over from the Big Ugly Forklift project. If you guys scroll down through the archives, you can find a few videos I made about an ancient uh, Clark, I think it was a C500 with a 13,500 pound capacity and these are the forks off of that machine. I scrapped that machine, it was, it was too far gone to fix economically, but I saved the forks and they're gonna work just fine on this machine. They're 48 inches long. Now the second problem is there's something wrong with the mast. It will not go up beyond the first stage. So something's caught or binding or something and it's not allowing the second stage to come up. Uh, third problem, the gland seal on this tilt cylinder is blown, leaks oil all over. Uh, fourth problem, the brake master cylinder was completely bone dry and I poured a little bit of brake fluid in there in a futile attempt to revive the brakes. Had no luck and uh, actually ended up breaking off one of the bleeders. So the brake system needs a complete overhaul. Uh, fifth problem, the charge light here on this little indicator stays on all the time. So the last problem is also I think the most bizarre. I don't know how well it's going to show up on the camera, but I want you to just kind of sight along the mast here and then compare it to the chassis of the forklift. And if you look closely, I think you're going to notice that the, the body of the forklift kind of leans a little bit this way. And if you look at the gap here between the tire and like what would be the fender, it's basically almost rubbing the tire on this side and there is a gap big enough to put your hand in on the other side. I have no idea what's causing that problem or if it even really is a problem, but it, <laughs> it doesn't seem right. So I don't know if the bolts that hold the chassis to the mast are kind of wonky. Uh, anyway, we're gonna have to investigate that. So I bought a bunch of parts for this machine and I also bought a service manual. This is all from the local Clark dealership. But this is the wrong manual. This covers the Mitsubishi 4G54 engine, whereas we actually have the 4G64 engine. I bought a full set of brake shoes, two new bleeders, two new wheel cylinders, and two new master cylinders. I've got a hydraulic filter, an engine oil filter, oil, brake fluid. I'm waiting on a transmission filter and transmission fluid. So in this bag, there are two new timing belts, one for the balance shaft and one for the cam, a set of diaphragms for the vaporizer and the carburetor, two seal kits for the tilt cylinders, and some O-rings for the propane valve up here. Okay, a couple things before we get started. Seemed to be a lot of speculation in the first video that I stole this machine. Uh, that is not the case. In fact, I did find the original key and the key switch does in fact work. Uh, I did not steal this machine. I, I more or less traded for it, you know, doing some work down there at Location X, and you know, nobody wants this machine, so I took it home. The other conspiracy theory that's floating around from the first two videos, a lot of guys did not believe that this machine's been sitting in a field for 17 years. And I guess I could see that. I mean, it looks pretty good, but just take a look at the amount of, of moss that's grown on the paint here. <laughs> I mean, it takes a few years to, to build that up. And that's all the sticks and leaves and stuff on the seat. I have not cleaned that stuff off yet. Uh, the seat actually is in really good shape. I think it was brand new when the machine was parked. And yeah, it weathered really well. So pretty similar amount of moss growing on the counterweight back here. Gives it a nice patina. Now, I had a surprising number of people request that I film pressure washing this machine. I guess that's some kind of a YouTube fetish. So 
yeah, once we get her fixed up a little bit, we'll, we'll roll it outside and hose it down. And I will be sure to record it for you guys. I think we'll start with the brakes first. Probably because when I was a kid, you know, we never had anything that had brakes that worked. You know, we always had these old, like, Farmall tractors, and they'd sit outside all the time. And, you know, those, those Farmall tractors had those goofy, like, dry disc-style brakes. And you just couldn't leave them sitting outside. They'd get rusty, and then they wouldn't work. And then my dad would try to fix them, and it never worked right. So now as an adult, I have this, like, scar that causes a visceral hatred for equipment with brakes that don't work. <coughs> okay. So I would put this pancake jack and this hand pump up there with the most useful tools that I have. This thing is awesome. I think it's rated to lift like 20 tons. And it's, you know, it's small enough to fit under most things. It's got a decent amount of stroke. I think it's got like an inch and three quarters of stroke. It appears to be just a standard inboard drum setup. Now on my old C300, it had kind of a, a final drive, this whole final drive section that you had to pull out, and the brakes were on the inside of that. But this is just like an old school truck axle. So we're gonna have to pull the axle out, and then we'll probably have to take the bearings out and pull the whole hub off. And I should have ordered a wheel seal for it. funky setup on this thing. So it looks like there's no way to adjust these bearings. You just tighten that plate down and that's what you get. Well, I wonder how heavy that thing is. Okay, bearings look good. Bearing races look good. Okay, so on the back side of the backing plate, there's a little rubber plug. This is it right here. Pop that out, and you can access the brake adjuster. This is a brake adjusting spoon right here. There's a little star wheel, and you just adjust it until the brake shoes open up enough to get the drum off. So normally they're going to go easy one way and hard the other way. The easy way is tightening the brake drum because that's the self-adjusting feature. And the hard way is loosening it. That's not good. Looks like we lost this spring on this side here that holds the shoe, kind of holds the shoe in. And this spring here, I don't think it's broken, it just popped out. 
Oh, we've got a mess here. It's a, it's a lot worse than what I expected. So it looks like this spring is good and this bottom spring is good. This one is all bent up and mangled. This one here holds the shoe back to the backing plate. It's broken. This one holds the shoe back to the backing plate on the other side. I think it might be bent. It doesn't look very good. And there should be a spring right here. Must be like a, a rattle spring for this parking brake kind of fulcrum deal here. So this is your parking brake lever right here. And it has this, this piece here that it bears against. And there was a spring there, but it went flying off when all these brake shoes fell off. Uh, these two springs here pull the shoes back against the, the wheel cylinder. And then the bottom one pulls it against the adjusters. So one thing I didn't count on, it's actually got two adjuster wheels, which is kind of funky. And I only backed one of them off, so that explains why it was still kind of tricky to get that brake drum out of there. Now as far as the drum goes, it's pretty rough. The inside surface here is, is not good. It should have been machined. And really the shoes look pretty good. The problem is they ran them against that rough surface of the drum. And I don't want to put those back in there. I think they'll just, they'll just cause that same rough surface on the drum again. Now they do make a brake shoe resurfacing machine, but we probably have to go to the Smithsonian to find one. Oh, well, this'll be fun. This is an 80s machine, kind of like me. So it doesn't know whether it wants to be in inches or millimeters. So these wheel cylinders are metric, I guess. Probably out of the GM parts book. And some genius put them on there with socket head cap screws. So if I can get those loose, it's going to be a genuine miracle. Oh, boy. Of course, they give you no room to work. <laughs> yeah, right. There's no way those are coming out of there. No way. Oh. <laughs> Well, there's one. That's a good start. Come on, little guy. One more. Oh. <laughs> Must be my lucky day. Now, if we can get that flare nut off there without destroying that brake line, I'm buying a lottery ticket. That's it, fellas. Lottery time. The little sucker actually broke loose. I can't believe it. Well, let's not count our eggs before they hatch, though. We've still got the whole other side to go. Well, there it is. Yep. I hate this GoPro. Okay, that's why we're replacing the wheel cylinders. Because they're all rusty. Now, it might be possible to drive those pistons out. Get in there with the wheel cylinder hone, hone it out, replace the cylinder seals. But, I mean, honestly, the new wheel cylinders are like 12 bucks a piece. And they come with the bleeders, so I can send those back. Okay, I got the other side apart, and it looks much better. All the springs are where they're supposed to be. So I don't know. The other side must have just gotten, gotten a little bit wet or something at one time. Who knows? Okay, let's go for the master cylinders next. So there they are, tucked up in front of the steering column, kind of on the firewall there, which is not a very fun place to work on something. So I think... Looks like it's got hydrostatic power steering, so we should be able to just zip these bolts out of this bracket and the one at the bottom and the whole steering column should come back and then we'll have room to, to kind of get to those things. So the reason that this machine has two master cylinders, one is for the inching valve and one is for the brakes. 
So the inching valve is, for all intents and purposes, is the clutch. So it's a, a valve inside the transmission that basically dumps the fluid from the converter. So the machine basically, it's like having the, the clutch pushed in. So if you want to raise the forks real fast, you can push down the inching valve, rev up the throttle over there, raise the forks and the machine, you're not fighting against the stall of the converter. So the two pedals are mechanically interlocked. So you push the left side pedal down and you get both inching and brakes. If you push just the right side pedal down, you get only brakes. And so the advantage with that is if you're, let's say you're loading on a hill or something and you don't want to take a chance of rolling backwards, you just use the brake pedal and then it keeps the, the torque converter basically locked in so that when you let off the brake pedal, it doesn't try to roll back before that inching valve catches. And that's kind of a, a problem with these machines if you don't get the inching valve adjusted just right and it wants to, to freewheel until the converter catches up. Now there's a chance that these master cylinders aren't completely junk, but I'd say it's a slim chance because the boots are all torn and I'm sure 17 years of rainwater has been pouring down inside of those things. So I, yeah, I'm not even gonna mess with it. We're gonna replace them. Okay, that does help open it up, but these pins are gonna be fun getting out. Come on. weird it's almost like it sat outside for 17 years or something Come on. there's one And there's the other. So we got a steel bolt and an aluminum master cylinder. Uh -huh. There we go. Now that I think the hard lines are connected directly to these master cylinders, so we'll have to crack those loose. I wonder what size that hex is. And nope. And nope. <laughs> okay, fourth time's a charm. There it is, eleven sixteenths. And the, the flare nut is 10 millimeter. So yeah, this thing's a lot of fun to work on. Oh. There we go. I pinched the line off from the master cylinder so there shouldn't be a whole lot of brake fluid running out of here. even see this <laughs> that one's a different size oh boy I'm pretty lucky so far I mean it sat outside for 17 years but it's not like it got driven in salt every winter so really isn't too bad okay well, 
there wasn't any oil coming out of that thing. Well, that's not good. So these are supposed to be complete master cylinders. And that one is a complete assembly. But uh, this one, she's missing a little something here. And I can reuse the, the rod and the clevis, but I, I don't have the boot. So I guess we get to wait on that too. Nah, it's fine. I'll just do like a two second clip of this. Nobody wants to watch me turn a brake rotor. So I want to check the rear axle wheel bearings. I've got a feeling that we're going to find a problem there. So this one sounds pretty good. I don't hear anything kind of unusual. But this side, she's got a bit of a rumble. So I'm going to pull them apart. The, the back end of this machine was sunk down in the sand for however many years. What, like 17 years? So we probably got some water in there. I ordered seals. I have not ordered the bearings. So we'll pull it apart and see how they look. These are dust cap pliers. Super, super handy tool. Oh boy. Well, guesses on what size that is. Well, that's an inch and a half. A little bit sloppy. There we go. Inch and seven sixteenths. Yeah, there we go. They're not tight. Okay, that looks pretty good. almost like this forklift sat outside for 17 years. There we go. Okay, simple lip seal on that one. Yeah, that bearing's bad. The rollers don't look too bad. But the race, I can feel something on the race here. Okay, so you see that spot right there on the bearing race? And there's a few more of them around here. I'm sure we'll see them when we get this cleaned up. So that confirms what we heard with our ears. The inside bearing on this wheel is bad. Okay, the other side's not as bad, but it's, it's also bad enough that we need to replace it. So just the outside bearing, or sorry, the inside bearing. The outside one is, is fine. So that's just water intrusion. Well, after some more inspection, all of the rear wheel bearings are bad. So I went ahead and just bought all new wheel bearings for the rear axle. These are pretty common wheel bearing sets. I was able to buy these off the shelf from my local auto parts place. And they're national instead of Timken, but they're gonna be a big improvement over what we had. So we've got some damage to the bearing journal on the right side rear spindle. 
and the bearing must have been bad for a while or the previous set of bearings was really bad it, they've been replaced once before I'm, I'm sure of it so it definitely galled a little bit but it looks worse than it really is so here's the new the new bearing and I still have a good tight you know tight fit on that bearing journal so I'm not really worried about it I was concerned when I first took it apart because it looks so gruesome but I think that'll be just fine so on the inside of the hub here you can see these big pits in the bearing journal I'm pretty sure that's from the the last guy who was trying to drive those bearing races out that's the divots that were left behind by his tool so we should be able to clean that up pretty easily but yeah it's definitely had the bearings replaced at least once before looky what I've got another cannon this is an R700, so it's not quite the, the newest, toppest of the line, but should do the job. I picked this up at the local camera shop. They took it in on a trade, and the previous owner must have been a lot more gentle to it than I was to mine. I also bought the, uh, the UV filter for the lens, so I don't hopefully burn this one as many times with the torch or the welder. So standard wheel bearing setup procedure, I just tighten them until you're confident everything is seated, back it off, and then just hand tight on the nut until you can feel just a tiny little bit of a wiggle. 
And that's an acceptable end play for the bearings. You don't have to get any more complicated than that. Come on. Now, one thing I have learned from making all these YouTube videos, there is no way to properly install a cotter pin. There isn't one. No matter how you do it, somebody's going to have a problem with it. So today what we're going to try is bending the tail over the outside of the spindle like so and then cutting the other one off. And we'll leave it just like that. That's it, we're done. Well, I fooled around with these parking brake cables for way too long, trying to get them you know, freed up. I was able to get one moving freely. The other one's just rusted up solid. So I went ahead and just bought two new parking brake cables. They're only $11 a piece, so we might as well just replace them. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's see. There you are. So here are the new wheel cylinders. They look to be the same as the old wheel cylinders. So we'll go ahead and pop those in. There's that bleeder that was broken off. So we don't have to worry about that with the new one. So I'll put a bit of anti-seize around that big locating diameter right there. And then just a little dab on these mounting screws. Normally I would not advocate using anti-seize on a mounting screw for any kind of a brake part, but this isn't exactly a Formula One car, so I think we're going to be okay. Plus it's these low head, socket head cap screws. So I want to be sure these things are going to come out again in the future. Okay, we've got a new brake shoe set and a whole new spring kit. I attempted to buy just the springs that I needed, but she said it's cheaper just to buy the whole kit than it is to buy them piecemeal. I think it was like 11 bucks for that whole kit of springs. So that's fine, we'll go ahead and replace all of those. And then the brake shoes are, they're kind of pricey. They're basically uh, $30 a shoe. this worked before. There we go. There we go. Brake shoes installed. Well, I ran into another snag with the master cylinders. So this setup uses a remote reservoir. Here's the reservoir right here. And it feeds the master cylinders through these flexible hoses, which is fine. Except that this is not a hose that's approved for brake fluid. I don't know if you guys can read it, but it says right there, fuel. This is just 5 16 fuel line. The fuel hose is just made from like a Buna N type of a rubber and it's not resistant to brake fluid. You need an EPDM type of rubber to, to hold up. 
so we're gonna have to replace those. So I made an order to Summit Racing and I bought two of these Tilton 5 16 brake master cylinder reservoir hoses. This is the for real stuff that's approved for use with brake fluid. I also bought two of these Willwood master cylinder boots. I think the dimensions are going to be right for our master cylinders. We'll find out here in a minute. So here's the problem with building a machine that uses both metric and inch size fasteners. Now actually most of the fasteners on this thing are metric, but apparently whoever worked on this thing before didn't know that. These are M6 bolts and somebody tried to put a quarter 20 nut on them and you see they're both stripped out basically in the same spot. So I dug around and found some M6 nuts and I'm thinking that we can just use use some washers to kind of space this nut out to the portion of the thread that's still good. Well it just keeps getting curiouser and curiouser. This is the T that they were using for the remote reservoir. They had the hoses just kind of jammed over top of this thing. So it looks like a flare type T and somebody took a file or a grinder or something and just ground all the threads off. <laughs> so I, I don't know what to make of that. So we are definitely not going to reuse this. Well it's snowing like hell outside so I guess the cowards at the hardware store decided to close early. Which means we can't get the fittings that we need to finish the master cylinder plumbing. So we'll have to wait on that. I think in the meantime we'll go ahead and put the steering column back in. Get the parking brake cables hooked up and then we can throw the drums back on and in the morning when we get the fittings that we need we can work on bleeding the brakes. I also noticed for whatever reason two bolts are missing out of the the pedal assembly where it bolts to the firewall. So we'll try to come up with something for that. It's like maybe a third one missing there. I have no idea why. I think we're ready to put the hubs back on. And I did go ahead and machine the brake drum surface here. The maximum rebore diameter on these drums is 11.84 inches or 303 millimeters. We're very close to that. We're only about 10 thousandths, you know, one fourth of a millimeter away from that maximum diameter. So in theory, the next time that this gets done, the hubs are going to have to be replaced. And I mean, the, the brake drum is integral to the hub, so the whole the whole shooting match has to be replaced when that happens. This is the new seal. So this is what's called a two-piece seal. So the sealing actually happens between this outside sleeve and the inside rubber. And then this, this lip right here is actually supposed to be stationary on the axle stub. Anyway, go ahead and pop that in. Now, I'm sure there's a for real installation tool for this. I don't have one. But what I do have is the old seal. And it should make a pretty good install tool. Just like that and don't forget to put your bearing in first so we'll go ahead and put this together uh, one thing I didn't notice when I took it apart there are actually shims that set the bearing preload or backlash so the shims go between this retainer plate and the end of the axle stub now we're not replacing the bearings so we shouldn't be affecting the bearing backlash but we we probably will go ahead and check that anyway but I don't expect it to be a problem I went on so easy.
There we go. All right, so one thing to note about these two-piece seals, you're probably going to have to kind of draw the draw the seal down onto that axle stub. It's just kind of the nature of the beast. So it's a tight fit around the stub. So you don't want that part to spin. But it makes them a little bit more, in my opinion, a little bit more tricky to install. It also makes it kind of hard to get them apart without wrecking them. Okay, looks pretty good. I'm going to go ahead and check the bearing end play real quick with a dial indicator. Probably looking for it to be somewhere in the one to four thousandths range or something like that. But I mean this thing is so slow, slow speed, it doesn't, it probably doesn't really even matter. Uh, anyway, once we get that done, we'll go ahead and fold over this Squatch 253 approved fold over lock and we can put the axle shaft back in. At that point, we'll basically be done. Well, actually, this is not a Squatch 253 approved fold over lock because I'm going to reuse the old one. So we'll just, we'll just leave it at that. Now, there was no gasket, so we're using silicone. That's it. Well, I could not buy a 5 16 barb T locally, so I had to piece it together from $30 worth of brass fittings. But it'll do the job, and it'll be better than this little homebrew item. Okay, I got our master cylinders plumbed up. I'm not 100% happy with how it came out, but I don't really know how to do it any better. This T is kind of bulky. I wish I would have gotten the, the, right, the right part for that, but... I think it's okay. This this one line that goes to the brake master cylinder, it's it's pinched a little bit, but I mean we're talking about tiny amounts of fluid that need to pass through there, so I think it'll be just fine. And I did add a loom clamp here to hold the hose so that we don't get it hitting on anything too badly. Uh, this brake pedal's gonna have to be adjusted anyway, so it's not gonna come back that far. Anyway, I'm sure it's good enough. If it gnaws at me too bad, I can always take it apart and fix it later. Okay, time to get back to work on this forklift. Wife pulled me off of the project yesterday to go to a wedding, which is fine, I guess. I'm telling you what, there's a special place in hell for wedding DJs. Anyway, we need to adjust the brake shoes. It's a little bit different than a normal system. The cool thing is they give us this hole in the brake drum and we can actually reach the adjusters down here at the bottom through this hole. So that's cool, we don't have to do the old reach around routine from the back side through the backing plate. Now, <clears throat> the other thing that's kind of odd to me, the way that the book suggests to adjust the brake shoes is through this slot right here using a feeler gauge. So we run the thing down to about the, I don't know, eight o'clock position or so. So we're gonna set the clearance here with a 10 thousandths feeler gauge. Now, these are not self-adjusting brake shoes, as far as I can tell anyway. They're manually adjusted only. So there's the adjuster right there. Except that's the wrong way. Yeah, we've got a long ways to go. And we had to adjust each brake shoe independently because they have their own adjusters. It's not a it's not a floating system like what we're used to. Okay, I think we're good. You can just hear it dragging, so I think it's I think it's gonna be just fine. And by the way, I did mark these drums left and right so that I wouldn't get them mixed up when I was turning them, because that could affect that bearing 
end play as well. Okay, time to bleed the brakes. And it's gonna be a little bit more complicated than you know a normal brake bleed procedure because we have all new components. And one thing I've learned from doing the YouTube videos, there's a lot of tribalism around bleeding brakes. Everybody's got their, their favorite little method and they're real mad when you don't use it. Here's what we're gonna try. I am going to use a vacuum pump and this little reservoir. This thing's made for evacuating fluids and bleeding brakes. Now I put a little bit of grease around the threads of the bleed screws when I installed them. Hopefully that prevents them from sucking too much air around the threads. I'm going to start with the right side wheel cylinder. The way I was always taught to bleed brakes is you start with the one that's the furthest from the, the master cylinder. So yeah, let's give her a shot here. Now what the book tells you to do, the manual, it tells you to power bleed the brakes from the bottom up. So basically pressurize the brake fluid and force it up through the wheel cylinders into the master cylinder reservoir. Which I think is a pretty good method, but I don't have the, I don't quite have the right setup to do that. So we're gonna try this instead. I don't really know why it matters if it's bottom up or top down. So here we go. Well, attempts to bleed the brakes were not successful. I ended up taking the master cylinder back off and I added this 90 degree fitting here instead of trying to bend that hose, you know, around at a 90 degree angle. It was just too tight. I think it was pinching off the, the hose and basically blocking the flow of fluid from the reservoir to the master cylinders. So we just threw another $20 worth of brass fittings at it and that should be a lot better. Okay, the problem was not related to that line being pinched from being bent 90 degrees. So I'm glad we fixed it though because it's one of those gnawing things where, you know, every time the brakes don't feel quite right, you're gonna think, oh man, is that is that line pinched off? Is that causing the problem? You know, so. This way we can sleep at night, feel good about it, get all nice and warm and fuzzy inside. Well, check this out. It works. We got brakes. Well, I don't know who designed the brakes on this Clark, but I'd like to get a hold of him. This has got to be one of the stupidest brake systems I've ever seen. So the, the biggest problem is, look at the, the master cylinders are mounted vertically, right? So basically it's impossible to bench bleed those master cylinders because you know as soon as you tip them up vertically all the oil just runs out the bottom and then especially by the time you get them mounted up in here in front of the steering column and wrestled in there you're gonna be right back where you started before you tried to bleed them now because you can't bench bleed the master cylinders you end up with this big air pocket in here so I don't know if any amount of trying to bleed the brakes with the pedal would ever get that air out of that master cylinder Really the only way to get that out of there is with a power bleeder. Now what the book tells you to do is to use a power bleeder to reverse bleed the brakes. So basically push oil in through the bleeders at the wheel cylinders until it comes out the reservoir. Which that would work fine but I don't have the right, the right stuff to do that. So I figured I could just power bleed the brakes through the reservoir here like you normally do. But turns out I don't have the right adapters for that either. So here's the workaround that I came up with. So right there on the reservoir cap is a vent and I've got this air nozzle with a rubber tip. All I do is just put the air nozzle over that vent, apply a little bit of air pressure like so and that pressurizes the reservoir and forces brake fluid throughout the system. And that actually worked pretty well. You just gotta be careful you don't run out of brake fluid in your reservoir. This reservoir is pretty small. So let me show you how it works on the inching valve. That's the last system that I have left.
So a number of guys have recommended using the vacuum pump for bleeding brakes, but I found it to be totally useless. All that happened was air sucked in around the threads of the bleeders, and we never really got anywhere with it. And I did put grease on the threads. It didn't help at all. I just, I don't think it's a good method. Okay, I finally got it set back down on the wheels. And before I did that, I went ahead and drained the oil out of the transaxle. Here's a little sample of it right here. It's pretty scuzzy looking stuff. Now, my old forklift, the C300 I had, it used just regular Dextron automatic transmission fluid for the transaxle. This is a little bit different. So that's a TA18 Clark transaxle and it actually takes a, a combination hydraulic slash transmission fluid. So here's what I bought for it. It's a MyStick JT5. It's supposed to be equivalent to the, the Chevron 1000 that they specify in the manual. And I think it's basically equivalent to like what John Deere would call high guard or trans guard or whatever, whatever they call their, whatever John Deere calls their hydraulic slash transmission oil. It's pretty much the same thing. This stuff should work just fine. Uh, also, the dipstick for the transaxle goes in that little hole right there. It was rusted solid, so I, I got it cracked loose, but in the process, I kind of ripped this ring off the top, so I just had to weld that up real quick. But the, the working part of the dipstick is just fine, so we'll get that filled up. Okay. Go ahead and install my $70 transmission oil filter. I don't know what's so special about it, but they're very proud of it. Okay. Okay, I got the parking brake adjusted, and it works. I think we are done with the brakes. So what do you guys want to do next? We can do the cylinder, we can do the timing belt, we can do the diaphragms, we can change some oil. Maybe we'll clean up a little bit and see how it looks.